once again, we're thrilled to be with you on a Tuesday, last Tuesday in January, in fact. And I've received quite a number of excellent questions from you all from all over the world, actually, this week. So let's begin with those. <clears throat> Here's a man who says, uh, my wife has run away from home after saying that she was depressed and would, quote, take care of it, uh, end quote, only a week before that. I assume he means take care of her depression. Uh, do I just give her space and wait for her to come around, or what? What do I do? If somebody says that they're depressed and promises to take a sane course of action, <clears throat> in other words, to take care of their, their depression, treat it, do something about it, and then suddenly, um, within a few days, simply vanishes, runs away from home, um, what do you think the odds are that they are thinking sensibly or sanely? Uh, zero. So uh, something you know obviously needs to be done. Uh, your wife is screaming that she's in pain. Uh, running away from home, um, well, that's a it's pretty major withdrawal. Uh, so I would not recommend just waiting uh, and sitting around and hoping that things change. <clears throat> now they might, uh, but even if they did, it would take a very long time. And by the time they did change, you may have irreparable harm done. Uh, so don't wait. Uh, but I also don't recommend that you reach out and be um, clingy uh, or demanding or reach out with an air of desperation. Because if she's running and in pain and you reach out with an air of desperation and and a sense of urgency, oh, you have to do something, she's running from that. Uh, you're going to make things worse. So what you need to do is reach out and offer support. <coughs> offer questions. Um, you might reach out and say, you know, what can I do? Uh, it's obvious that you might say, well, it's obvious that you're in pain, that you're hurting, uh, or you wouldn't have done this. Um, is there something that I can offer? You also might take responsibility. If Now, I realize that as she's running, there's clearly a lot wrong in your relationship or she wouldn't be leaving. Uh, and that probably she's done a great deal wrong uh, or you wouldn't be at this place. But this isn't the time to bring that up. Uh, she's in a lot of pain. And so this would be the time to take responsibility for your mistakes. So a conversation just briefly, you know, we can't do the entire conversation, and I can't do it for you because I don't know what your relationship's like. You've only described that she's depressed and is run away from home. I mean, this is a two-sentence message. But you take responsibility for the mistakes you've made. You say, you know, it's obvious that you're in pain, and I know that I've contributed to that. And I know I've contributed by being unloving in the following ways. I have been, for example, and I don't know how you've been unloving, but I have been critical. Um, I have been unsupportive. Um, I've been judgmental. I've been, and these are very likely because runners tend to run because of these behaviors. So I've been critical, judgmental, unkind, unsupportive, um, attacking, angry. This is what runners run from. Um, so you talk about the mistakes you've made and then say, and what I'd like to do is learn how to change that. 
Um, I'd like to learn how to listen to you better. I, I want to do whatever it takes so that you can be happier. Uh, you do that and, and when you make it clear that your goal is to help her to be happier, not just to get her to come back. If you contact her and your primary goal is to get her to come back with you, then see that's obviously selfishly motivated. It's all about you. Uh, but if your goal is to help her be happier, well, that's a whole lot sweeter. Um, and you don't want to push her or manipulate her. It's, it has to be selfless. And if it is, there's a chance you can help her. Um, so that's what I would recommend as a first step. And if you want to know more about additional things you can offer her and words you can say, Use the conference calls and you'll get more help from people. Uh, the next person says, uh, I think it was you on last night's conference call. Now last night obviously would have been, uh, who knows, a week ago, that made the statement, um, all cleaners are liars. That statement has stayed with me since last night, but I'm not sure I'm completely clear as to what it means. Um, when we cling, uh, clinging is, is anything that we do to uh, pull or manipulate uh, imitation love from people who wouldn't otherwise get it from us. Uh, so there are lots of ways that we can cling. Um, we can cling by being uh, excessively grateful so that people will give us more. We can cling by hanging on to a relationship, staying in it, trying to get the relationship to just last longer so that we'll get more. We can cling by uh, when a partner is, for example, if you're dating and your partner's about to go home and you go, oh, do you, do you have to go now? Um, you can cling just by saying, um, I love you. If the reason that you say I love you is not truly to express unconditional love, but so that your partner will respond with, I love you too. Now, how do you tell the difference between truly saying I love you and saying I love you so that your partner will say I love you too? Pfft, easy. It's that sense of urgency when you say I love you. You say I love you and then there's this feeling in you of like, and, and then the absolute dead giveaway is if your partner doesn't respond in the way you want when you say, I love you. If they don't immediately come back with, I love you too, and you're disappointed or annoyed, well, then you know that's why you said it, was to get some kind of similar response. Now, it's a, now you know it. But you can still know you're clinging, even if they say what you want, if there were some sense of expectation that they would. So now what do I mean by clingers or liars? Um, if you say to your partner, um, I love you, and then as soon as you say I love you, there's this feeling of like, wow, I'd kind of like my partner to say I love you back. When you say I love you to your partner and you hope they'll say something in response, how many times have you ever heard somebody honestly say this? How many times have you ever heard this? Have you ever seen, how many times have you ever seen this on a movie screen? Which actually ty just typifies how we live because the people who write um, screenplays, the people who write movies are us, human beings. How many times have you ever seen in a movie somebody, you know, uh, an actor you know, look over at his girlfriend or the girlfriend at him and say, I love you. By the way, you better say I love you back. That's why I said it to you, is so that you would respond with I love you. How many times? Zero. So the reason I say clingers are liars is because when we do things to cling so that people will give us the attention, the affection, the acceptance, the whatever that we want, do we ever tell the truth about why we did it? No. No, we're deceptive. We do it under the table. So it's a lie. Clinging is always a form of lying. And this is true with 
pretty much all the getting and protecting behaviors. Rarely is there such a thing as a getting and protecting behavior that flies solo. No, they're almost always paired up or tripled up or with or all together, like anger. You get angry, you almost always felt victimized in the first place. So anger and victimhood are paired up and, and so on. But that's what I meant. Here's a man who says, uh, my wife and daughters have added four cats to our household, which brings tears to my eyes just for him to say, since I'm allergic to cats. Makes me want to cry on multiple levels, actually. <clears throat> and one of the cats is definitely not well trained. I made it clear that I don't want that many animals, but I was ignored. I came home exhausted one evening and went to bed to find that one of the cats had peed on the bed all the way through the blankets and sheets. The cat did this because the cat box had not been cleaned. Um, that makes sense. I didn't know that about cats, but I guess so. Cat box isn't clean. Cat's got to pee somewhere. Why not on your bed? Uh, the cats are supposed to be the girl's responsibility, but they don't take care of them. Now that part I understand. Uh, <laughs> This is this is almost a universal tradition. The children say, Dad, we want to get a pet. And the parents say, but you won't take care of the pets. And the children say, oh, oh, but Dad, we promise we will. And so the parents, being retarded, say, oh, well then if you promise, <laughs> If it's a real promise, then okay, we'll get the pet. <laughs> How stupid are we parents? So then, of course, the children don't take care of the pets, and of course, then the parents have to do it. Uh, so the cat box hadn't been cleaned, and the girls are supposed to take care of that, but they don't. The problem is that my wife is not willing to discuss the cats. She wants to keep all four and will not consider getting rid of any of them. I feel completely disregarded, like I have no say in my own home. When I try to talk about this subject, she shuts me out and refuses to talk to me. So, your question is, what do we do about the cats? And you have to understand, this is critical, that the problem is not the cats. So, we, we're, we may talk a little bit about the cat problem in a minute. but. It's not a cat problem. The problem is you, you. Notice, not your wife, not your kids. The problem is you and the way you live your entire life. You have to hear this, and I'm not picking at you, but you have to see it or you're doomed. Because if we just solved a cat problem, if I said, all right, here's what you say to your wife, and here's what you say to your daughter, and here's what you do with the cats. We could, for example, take all four cats out and shoot them, and you'd have the cat problem solved, wouldn't you? Uh, but you'd be right back where you were in no time. We can take the cats to the pound. Um, we could get a special cat room. Um, I could give you a number of problems that would solve the cat problem, um, and you'd still be miserable. So this is not a cat problem. It's a you problem. Um, so we can't address this problem in isolation. So, uh, and this is true with virtually all the problems in our lives. People call me, they want to solve an isolated problem, and if I attempt to do that, I do them a huge disservice. So, so what are your wife and, and your kids doing? They're acting like victims, they're controlling you, they're ignoring you, and, and it's a real mess. Why are they doing that? They're, they're controlling you and getting a sense, of, well, let, let's look at your kids. Your kids are out of control. Um, your kids don't feel unconditionally loved. Your kids do pretty much whatever they want to do. Buy cats, I'm guessing it's way worse than that. I'm guessing you have trouble getting your kids to do homework. I'm guessing you have problems with your kids in a lot of different ways. 
and that they ignore you because they get a sense of power over you, which is way better than being not loved, um, all because of a lack of love in your home. Now, why does your wife refuse to discuss this matter with you? Oh, this is really easy. She's an absolute pushover, knows absolutely nothing about unconditional love, and so what she does is get a sense of imitation love by buying the conditional approval of your daughters. She's already rung, rung as in ringing a cloth, a past tense, she's already rung all of the imitation love that she's ever going to get, or at least in her opinion, that she's ever going to get out of you. You're a dish rag, you're done. But she still gets a sense of imitation love by getting the conditional approval from your daughters. So if she were to tell your daughters, get rid of the cats, or even take care of the cats, well, they might be mad at her. And there's no way she's going to face down your daughters and have your daughters mad at her. But you, uh, she doesn't really care about you because she's learned that you're not going to say anything like, you, like you're like you not. I mean, you already said, well, I don't really want the cats. But then once they decided to keep the cats, you just backed down and gave in. And she's going to keep earning the approval of your daughter. So they have this kind of little mutually, conditionally approving society going on and they're feeding each other and you don't compete. You can't. They know how to make each other temporarily, artificially happy and you don't know how to play their game. So you're out of the loop. So it's all an imitation love festival that they're in it's a disaster. They're not genuinely happy. And you don't know how to play this game, and you're screwed. Actually, the entire family is doomed because there's no unconditional love here. If it were unconditional love, they wouldn't be ignoring you. So, what's the solution? Um, you, you first need to learn a great deal more about what unconditional love looks like. Like as in study unconditional love, like read about it, like go on the conference calls, like feel more unconditionally loving yourself, and then start practicing loving your wife and talking to her about what unconditional love would look like in your marriage and then bit by bit start applying the principles of unconditional love as you learn them, as you read about them in real love and marriage and real love and parenting to both your wife and then your daughters. But you can't start applying these principles until you first feel more loved and loving yourself, which you've got to first get outside your home because there's no way from what you're telling me that you're going to get that unconditional love from within your home. You're being ignored there. So you can't apply these principles in theory without your feeling loved and loving first. You go and take those principles out of the book and attempt to just apply them, you're going to be a dead man. For example, if you go and just start applying consequences to your daughter straight off, you're going to be dead. Now, to give you an idea of what it will look like eventually, we can talk about that. But you don't want to do this right off. For example, eventually applying consequences to children would look like that the girls would not be able to play. They would not be able to go to the mall with their friends, they would not be able to watch television, play on the computer, whatever, until they did their jobs. Period. Which would include taking care of the cat. Um, so that the cat litter box would be changed every single day. Now, as you feel more loved and loving, you may be able to get to the place where you can start applying consequences to the girls fairly soon. And you can start at least telling the girls, girls, have you emptied the cat litter box, you can at least dis, you know, remind them of their jobs starting today in a more loving way. You can start teaching them almost immediately. And on the days that they don't do it, 
at least in the short term, at least you can empty the litter box yourself so you don't get your bed peed on. Or you can install a deadbolt on your bedroom door so that the cats aren't in your bedroom. See, so there are a lot of little things you can do in the short term while you're learning about real love. But you certainly don't have to put up with your bedroom being you know, peed in. And just as the girls have to live with consequences, so do cats. So a cat can't stay in a house unless he behaves either. You know, in the beginning when you got the cat, I'm sure that you said you can have the cat if you take care of your responsibilities and you take care of the cat. And if the cat doesn't behave himself in the house, um, you don't have to live with a cat who's going to destroy your property. At which point, you may have to decide that the consequence for a cat who destroys your property is the cat gets to move. Because if it's between you and the cat, Mm, if you decide you're going to put up with the behavior, you're the fool. Um, there are different ways to move a cat. We can talk about that on another occasion. But you need to learn to feel more loved and loving first. And remember that this issue is about you first and about a cat second. So work on that and we'll talk about the cat on another occasion in greater detail. <clears throat> Here's a woman who said, uh, our neighbors had a riding lawnmower that broke. I wasn't home, uh, so they asked my wife if they could borrow ours, and she said, oh, sure, you can borrow our mower. But then she thought, well, maybe I should uh, ask my husband just to be sure, so she called me at work. Uh, and I said, no way they can borrow my mower. Uh, because I've seen my neighbor. He doesn't take care of his equipment, and besides, I've learned what happens when you loan equipment to friends. Bad things. So now, my wife is angry because she said that she uh, looked bad when she called the neighbor up and had to change her mind, and that we look selfish because we won't loan the mower to the neighbors. And now she's saying, what would Jesus do? <laughs> and I said... Jesus didn't have a riding mower. <laughs> so I don't know what to tell her. So I'm going to suggest a relatively new principle here in real love that I'm going to ask you and the listeners to kind of work over in your minds. It's really not a new principle because we've kind of talked around it before, but it has a new name anyway. Uh, and we've tr I've tried it out actually at seminars on a number of occasions. But I want you to try it out and just see whether it needs to be reworded in any way. We'll field test this. You will be the trial audience. Uh, it's called the veto principle. And here's how it works. In a partnership, like a marriage, you both make decisions together, just like in a business partnership. So before you do anything that affects both of you, you both have to agree. Not complicated, huh? Easy to follow so far. The veto principle states that in a true partnership, you don't make any new decisions that have a significant effect on both of you without the agreement of both partners. So the veto of either partner is enough to stop any such decision. Now, that only makes sense. In a partnership, it's kind of like you're both in a canoe. So if one of you, just one of you, decides to head in a new direction, it affects the other person. You need the agreement of your partner before you do that. Now, if you make a decision that affects only you, well, great. If you want to change your soap that you use or your shampoo or your cereal, go for it. Um, but you can't change something that affects you and your partner. If you do that, your partner can exercise his or her veto. Now, you can't use this frivolously. You can't use this in a complicated way. For example, let's say your husband wants to watch football 
on Saturday. You can't say, well, this affects my time with you. This affects both of us. Now follow this. This affects both of us. So I veto that decision. No. See, notice I said you can only veto a decision that affects both of you unavoidably. Because, see, his decision to watch football doesn't have to affect you. You can always choose to do something else. Do you see? You can do anything else. You can do whatever you want to with your time. You can only veto something when he chooses to do something that has to affect you, where you have no other choice if he makes that decision. Like, he chooses to change direction in a canoe. So, here was this woman who decided, um, sure, you can borrow his riding mower. Well, that affects him immediately. You see, what if he decides, for example, to use his mower that afternoon? Or the neighbor breaks the mower. Now he can't use his mower for the next two weeks. No, she can't make a decision that will unavoidably affect both of them. I'll give you another example. When I first married Donna, which has been, wow, shortly after the Civil War, um, she wasn't nearly as comfortable in social situations um, as I was. And so I told her that wherever we went, um, no matter what was going on, um, no matter how I was engaged in the social situation, no matter how many people were around, all she had to do was touch me, look at me, lift her eyebrows, indicate in any way at all, and I would immediately stop what I was doing and I would take her home. Right then. No reason. She didn't have to give me a reason. She didn't have to explain. We would be gone. That's an example of the veto. Why? Because if we're out together at a place, then see, if I decide to stay, it unavoidably affects her. See that? So if she says, I'm really uncomfortable here, my deciding to stay makes it so she doesn't have a choice. Now, you could reason, this is difficult, this sounds difficult for those of you who are lawyers. One could reason that if she decides to leave, that that unavoidably affects me. No, it doesn't work that way. Because our normal routine would be at, to be at home. Notice I said you can veto anything that is a change from your routine. Our change was to be away. And so if, she, if we get away and she decides to veto it even later, I'm not feeling comfortable here. We're gone. We leave. We go home. You don't have to veto it ahead of time. You can veto it right in the middle. Do you see? Now, by making that decision, by my saying, you can veto what we're doing in the middle of this thing at any time you want, how loved do you think she felt? See? Now, she does the same thing with me. Um, let's say that we go shopping somewhere. Uh, I actually do that occasionally, um, at least twice in the last 10 years. And, and she'll sometimes say, at any, at any point, if you feel like you want to go home, even if she's in the middle of something, you just say something and I will stop what I'm doing and we'll turn around and I'll take you home and then I'll come back and do what I'm doing. You see how cool it is when you work in a partnership to have a veto power. What it communicates to your partner is how much you love them. And you don't have to explain yourself. All it has to be is, I feel uncomfortable, or I feel afraid, or frankly, I feel selfish. That's all it takes. I just don't want to. The bottom line point is this. I would never do anything to intentionally, knowingly, cause my partner unnecessary pain or inconvenience. That's the purpose of it. And when that happens, 
my partner can say, I want this to stop, and it's over. That's the purpose of the veto. That's it. Not so she can get her way, but to stop unnecessary pain or inconvenience. It's very cool. <clears throat> anyway, let me know what your uh, experience is with that as you play with it yourselves. Um, as an aside, um, starting, you're going to be getting uh, a what do they call those? Newsletter uh, sometime tonight, and we're going to be starting a new conference call. Uh, we have a conference call every night of the week. We're going to be adding one on Thursdays. There's already a conference call from 8 to 9. We're going to be adding one from 9 uh, to 10 Eastern Time, uh, and it'll be the first conference call that I'll be running. So I'll be running a conference call from 9 to 10 on Thursdays, uh, and you can learn more about that by going to the website, the Real Life website. And uh, if you go to All Services and pull down the menu, and you'll see uh, an entry there called uh, Greg's Conference Call, uh, and it'll tell you all the details of it. Or you can go to the Conference Call uh, site, and there's just a new entry for Thursday at 9. Here's somebody who writes... I have read your definition of real love as caring about the happiness of another person without wanting anything in return. I want to ask, don't we all want something from the person we show love to, even if it is only that they hear us or understand us? I'm not talking about getting or protecting behaviors, but just these simple desires to be understood. 99% of the time, you're right. Uh, we do want something from the people that we show love to. We want a little appreciation. We want some gratitude. We want a little recognition, at the very least. Uh, and most of us want even more than that. We want some love in return. But I'm learning that as we progress in our ability to love, uh, we can actually reach the state where we do not require anything from the person we love. Now, I could not have told you that 12 years ago, but I'm learning that we really can love somebody without wanting anything from the other person. Not at all. And I've become amazed in my own foolish, stupid way as I'm learning at my own ability to do this, to care about somebody without wanting something in return. Now, I'm far, far from perfect. I mean, maybe I'm at 5% of what I hope to someday be. I, I'm still feeble and foolish. But there are times that I can do it for 5 minutes at a time, 10 minutes at a time, oh, maybe 12 minutes at a time. So I, I just, I'm just telling you I know it can be done because I've experienced moments of that where I can care about somebody else's happiness and want zero back. As I meet with people and talk with them on the phone, for example, or I meet with them in person uh, as I write to them, I do hope that they will, to borrow three of your words, hear and understand, quote, hear and understand what I'm saying and offering. Now, obviously I do, or I wouldn't be talking to them. So note what I just said. I hope that they will hear and understand what I offer to them. Maybe even that they will feel loved. But I hope this, now this is in my best moments, because I hope that they will benefit so that they will get some kind of reward. Most of the time, I'm not hoping that they will hear and understand me, which was the quote that you just gave. You said it's very natural that, that, that when we love somebody that they will hear and understand us as a person. I'm not looking for a return from them. I am hoping that they will get some benefit, which is only understandable. If I didn't have some kind of hope that they would get something, why else would I be on the phone with them? Or why else would I be meeting with them? So, 
not wanting a return for them is the definition of real love. Real love is caring for somebody without an expectation for uh, something in return. So my goal is to continue to love so that my ability to do this simply happens more often and for longer periods of time. Now you continue. Don't we all have the ultimate want of receiving unconditional love in return, even if we realize that we may not get any real love from this or in any particular per any real love from this or any particular person? Isn't this what we all want or hope for? Yes. Uh, if we want unconditional love in return, it's not unconditional love that we gave. So, um, so you are saying that we have the ultimate want of receiving unconditional love in return. If we want unconditional love in return, then we're not giving unconditional love. As soon as you want something back, you're not loving. Sometimes people will say to me, well, I was loving him, but then when I didn't get, as soon as you're even thinking of getting, you weren't loving. You were investing. You continue. I understand that we shouldn't expect anything in return when showing real love or it would not be unconditional love. So I'm chuckling to myself because you really already understood this. I understand, you continue, that if we are disappointed or angry in any way, then we expected something which is not right. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, and you obviously do too. Then you continue. Even when we feel unconditionally loved by someone and can give this love to others, do we not still have wants and desires that we hope and perhaps have faith that they will be realized? I know this is a small, perhaps insignificant difference, but I just wanted your thoughts on this. The, the trick is to learn to receive real love freely from wherever we can get it and to give it whenever we can. Where we screw up is when we demand to get love from any particular person and the instant we do that it's not unconditional anymore. That's the biggest way that we screw real love up is when I insist on getting any particular thing from any particular person. So it's all about freely. That's the word. If I give whatever I give freely and just allow whatever comes to me to come freely. Not in return. Now we're trading. But just to come in return. Then suddenly the world becomes a pretty beautiful and rewarding place. But boy, if I'm looking for something back, oh, it's just endless disappointment. <clears throat> this writer says, my husband is suspicious and jealous of the relationship between me and my two daughters, his stepdaughters, and believes that we exclude him from belonging. My husband uh, and I have been together for five years and married for three. In the past, he has treated my daughters very harshly in terms of excluding them from conversations and gatherings and objecting uh, when they attempt to contribute to the household in so many ways. My daughters are aged 23 and 19 and do not live with us anymore uh, since they left home due to difficulties with his relationships with them, uh, essentially because it came down to it's me or them. However, the distrust and feelings of his exclusion remain with my husband. I understand that I can only try to love him unconditionally and request of him that he behave more civilly to my daughters so that they are comfortable to come to the house. This request is now so important that our relationship hinges on it. So you're saying that Essentially, your relationship with your husband now hinges on how, on how he responds to your request that he be more civil to your daughters. And then you continue. How best uh, can I ask him this question? And this is going to be difficult maybe for you to hear. It's not how you ask the question. It's that you don't ask the question. He's not feeling loved. This is pretty obvious. 
He's feeling excluded. He's feeling left out. He's feeling basically not loved at all. Uh, not loved probably from the time he was a little kid. Then he married you and hoped that you would be his salvation, that you would be the source of the unconditional love in his life. And then, horror of horrors, you ended up not filling his needs in some way. And in his mind, he saw that you were loving your daughters more than him. Now, whether this is true, mm, hard to know. I don't know. But that's his opinion. In his opinion, at the very least, you were not making the primary decision and putting him first. And that may well be the case. Um, partners usually perceive that correctly. In all the uh, marriages that I've looked at for whew, a lot of years, most of the time when a partner says, my partner puts his or her children before me, they've been right 95% of the time. It's true that the other partner does put the children before them. And the other partner then almost always responds with, yes, I do, because the children were there first. <laughs> I love that reason. <laughs> it's also the kiss of death. So, but we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, so he's not feeling loved and he's feeling empty and afraid and now what you're asking is how do you approach somebody who's empty and afraid and feeling excluded and feeling picked on and feeling alone now picture this empty, afraid, unloved, picked on and alone and you're going to go to this person who couldn't feel much worse and you're saying, how do you ask this person, I want you to be more loving to these two girls? He has um, a love quotient, um, a love sum, a love figure, a love number, if you want to grade real love from 0 to 100, of 1. He doesn't have any. None. And you're going to go to him and say, now, let, let's talk about this. How can I talk to you about being more loving, giving more love to these two girls? How do you ask that question? You don't. Because he has none to give. There is no way to ask him to be more loving. Impossible. It would be like asking him to be taller. It would be like asking him to grow wings and fly. I'm not exaggerating. I'm really not. He can't. Impossible. So there's no sense you formulating the question in your mind. The only way for him to be more loving toward your daughters, there's only one way, and that would be if he felt more loved. Period. Now, where's he going to get that from? I can give you a minute if you'd like, but it's not complicated. Um, he's not going to get it from the mailman. Uh, he's not going to get it from me. He doesn't know me. He's not going to get it from the neighbors. You're it, kid. Uh, you have some awareness of real love, or you wouldn't be here asking me this question. So the only way you're going to make a difference in your family, you're going to have to be the pioneer. Now, is that fair? Um, I don't know. Um, you want fair? Buy a ticket. Uh, fair's where the Ferris wheel is and where they show the pigs and the hogs. Uh, there ain't fair. Uh, if you're looking for fair, if you're looking for justice in the world, you're going to be unhappy your entire life long. So, not interested in fair. Somebody, if a family's going to change, somebody has to be the one that leads out. And it's going to have to be you. So if you really want things to change, you'd have to make a decision that for some period of time, and who knows how long it will be, but the better you do it, the shorter that period of time will be. You will have to make a unilateral, one-sided, all-you decision that you will unconditionally love him. It's the only way it's going to happen. And the cool thing is, that's fun. 
Unconditionally loving somebody else when they give you nothing back is fun. It's not about fair. It's fun. It's a gas. It's a hoot. Because you can only be happier as you're loving. So what you do to it, what you do is you go to him and you say, um, you know, this whole thing that's been going on with you and me and the girls and all that, I have been wrong. You tell him about the primary decision as it's written in the Real Love and Marriage book. You need to read the Real Love and Marriage book front to back. <clears throat> and you need to tell him, I have not put you first. I've let the girls get in the way. My bad. And so what I'm going to do is learn how to love you better. And so when I make mistakes in that area, will you help me by pointing that out? He will fall over dead. That's what he wants. All he wants from you is to feel loved by you. That's it. Then you need to have this conversation with the girls too. You need to tell the girls, been my mistake. I've confused you girls on many occasions and let you think that you were first. My bad. Uh, I had this conversation with my own kids from the time they were little. I said, if you guys ever get confused about who's first, um, let me straighten you up. I love you tons, but you're always second to mom. Mom will always be first. If you want to get between us, you're going to be really sorry to discover what happens. Um, there will always be plenty of love for you. Um, you'll always get loved a lot, but um, don't make it a contest because um, it will go miserably for you. And you need to tell the girls that. Because as you two become more loving and develop a more loving unit, you'll have even more love to give them. And if you tell your husband that, honey, you win. So don't go tell him that he needs to be more loving. Mm -mm. Go tell him you're going to be more loving. Boy, will you dig that. Here's somebody who writes, I've been in, uh, in real love a short time, about two months, and so has my former partner. Uh, we've been talking about real love quite a bit. We've been separated uh, a little over two years and had been together around 20 years. So here we got two people um, who had been together for 20 years but now been separated for two years and um, been talking about real love for two months. Uh, I had separated from her repeatedly over these many years. So this is a relationship that's been pretty rocky. Uh, I'm wanting to learn all I can about real love and she is asking me if I think we have a chance. I've always gotten to the place where I just couldn't be with her any longer. Sometimes it felt like codependency, other times it felt like love. I had always been with someone um, prior to that apparently uh, that wasn't really there like when I was married to an alcoholic. So having someone so present was uncomfortable. I also was able to speak up for myself as I wasn't able to in my marriage. Uh, I learned a lot in Al-Anon. My speaking up also caused a lot of conflict in our relationship. Um, of course, you know, just speaking up, I mean, speaking up is good, but just speaking up without love eh, really just is a, usually just turns into attacking. And we see this really commonly when people have been victimized and then feel like victims and have been, you know, walked over, you know, in relationship after relationship and then they're finally told to stand up for themselves. And so what they do is they go from being victims to being perpetrators. And they think that's an improvement. Um, and therapists will often do this with people. They take people who have been trumped on and trumped on and they say, stand up for yourself. And, and so these little mice of people, these little mouses, say, I'm not going to put up with it anymore. And they were trained to do this in therapy. And so they finally stand up and they're told to express their anger. And I see this in therapy groups to this day. And so these frightened little people think that it's an improvement to go from being walked on, which is just one form of 
getting and protecting behavior, one form of imitation love, being walked on to standing up for themselves and fighting back. Well, that's just trading one form of imitation love and getting and protecting behavior for another. Is it better? No, it isn't. Because you're just trading one for the other. Because neither of them is loving. So it's like trading one bag of garbage for another. Um, it's still death. So death is death. Does, is, did anybody really win from this trade? Not really. Um, you know, it looks like a step up because one's more active than the other, but it really isn't. Then you continue. I'm not sure that there's hope for us, or if it is what I want, this while I'm this new in real love. Do you have any feedback? So it's it's obvious from what you say. There's not a lot of information here, but it's obvious that you have not known how to have a loving relationship. So you had terrible, miserable relationships, you know, married to an alcoholic, didn't know how to speak up for yourself, you were walked on, awful. So then you have this new relationship and that's been on and off and in and out and on again, off again for 20 years. So still don't know how to have a relationship. And you've been separated for two years. So now you're just barely learning about real love and you're wanting to know, um, you know, what do we do? Do we want to go back together? Is there hope for us? That's really not the question. Um, in fact, this new in real love at two months, you don't even want to be asking about your relationship with this person. Um, Susie, you called her she, so just make up a name. You don't even want to be asking about that. What you want to be doing is asking, how do I find unconditional love? That's what you want to ask. And so <clears throat> you read the real love book, you go through the workbook, you uh, go through the essentials of real love video, you do the essentials uh, workbook. Um, you, you practice doing the workbook with uh, somebody else as a partner, not your ex-partner, uh, somebody with whom you don't have you know, a ton of baggage. And you learn what it's like to be unconditionally loved just for being you. You go on the conference calls. You learn about you. You learn what it's like to feel the healing, the, the peace, the calm, the, the power of being unconditionally cared for. And you do that without the additional burden, the pressure, the confusion of being in an exclusive relationship. Oh, don't even think about her at this point. No, not even a thought. Then as you become healthier, at some point, when you're in the conference call, when you're in a real love group, uh, then talk to your group and say, so what do you think? <clears throat> Am I sounding sane enough where I could even entertain the possibility of being in a relationship? Ask some sane people. Um, I recommend this to men and women everywhere. Um, years ago I was in a, a, a all men's uh, real love group. <clears throat> and we, we kind of had, and that's not a rule, um, because we don't really have rules, but we kind of had a guideline in this all men's group and because there were a number of single guys. And so the guideline was that if you are thinking about dating, we suggested that you come to the group and say to the guys in the group, guys, um, I'm thinking about dating, what do you think? And if, you know, half to two thirds of the guys in the, in the room fell on the floor, floor laughing out loud, probably probably you weren't ready to date. You know, it was a clue. That's what I suggest that people do to this day. Uh, if you're thinking about getting into a relationship, ask the people who know you. And they'll tell you. They'll say, no, no, I don't think so. Um, they'll tell you honestly. Ask people who see you from the outside. But at this point, well, I sure wouldn't recommend it. So do the two of you have a chance? Irrelevant. You just aren't ready. 
Um, you just need more time with feeling unconditionally loved by other people. Here's somebody who wrote and asked me, um, what would your life be like um, if you didn't need to be fixed? Oh, she, she was saying, someone asked me today, quote, what would your life be like if you didn't need to be fixed, end quote. And she said, I have no idea. Um, because she's always been fixed and always been a fixer of other people. Um, can you please talk about why people feel they need to be fixed and what the sure signs are of being fixed or that we are fixing others? Well, you know, why do we feel like we need to be fixed? That's pretty easy. Um, most of us have been told our entire lives long that we're defective. Uh, from the time we were little kids, whenever we did almost anything that the adults around us disagreed with, didn't like, how many times did we hear the question, why? Um, we'd go to do something and our parents would say, why are you doing that? Where are you going? What, what, why, why, what? Our parents questioned us about what we were doing endlessly. And it's because they didn't trust us. Uh, why did you do that? Why? It just never stopped. And then if we did something that they didn't entirely approve of, then we heard, even if it was just different in the style that we did it. I mean, holy smokes. We'd tie our shoes and they'd come over and retie them. Well, who cares if it looks sloppy? Or are you going to wear that? Or why does your hair look like that? Or parents correct their children nonstop all day long. It, it just never quits, most parents. And so we've been told a thousand different ways that something's wrong with us. And so we grow up thinking that, you know, we need to be fixed all the time. So what are the signs that we feel like we're being fixed? We get emotionally invested in the opinions of other people. Many of us actually seek out the opinions of other people constantly. Um, you see women do this with their clothing constantly. They put on something and then they ask everybody, what do you think of this? How do I look in this? What does this look like? What do you think? How do I look? How do I? You, you're kidding me. Why don't you just get dressed and go wherever it is you're going instead of asking everybody's opinion? We feel like there's something wrong with us. We have a need to know what everybody else thinks. And men do this too, <clears throat> just about different things. So we have this need to have other people help us, fix us, work on us, tell us what they think about things and fix us. Um, and what are the signs that we are fixing others? Oh, this is easy. We have this powerful need to give advice. People do something and we give our opinion. You know, unless somebody's asking you what their opinion is, most of the time it's just none of our stinking business. And yet we offer it constantly. I sit in groups of people all the time and I watch people endlessly offering their unsolicited opinion of other people's behavior. And I'm just rolling on the inside going, oh, why did you think they wanted to know that? And they do it unceasingly. Well, did you know that? And do you know, I think that telling people how they should behave. And the real evidence that we get invested in fixing other people is that if we offer our opinion and they're not glad to receive it or they don't act on our advice, we become disappointed or irritated. Oh, that is the absolute ultimate. People do this with me too. They'll offer me a suggestion. Then the next day they'll email me and say, well, did you get that whatever it was they sent me and did you do something with it? <laughs> I'm thinking, if I did and I had wanted to, I would have told you. <laughs> so we really do have a need to do that. And, and it's about power and about a need to be important. So look forward to seeing you on uh, the conference calls. Look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Uh, and in the meantime, remember that it's always about real love. It's about feeling it. It's about the joy of giving it to others. It's about the peace that we get from both feeling it and giving it. And we'll see you next Tuesday.